I want to show you something very interesting about the pressure distribution on the cricket ball. We have looked at the pressure distribution on a circular cylinder in the class for a real flow. It is quite different than that for a potential flow. So on this uh, chart, the x axis is the Reynolds number and the y axis is actually the angle phi. The phi angle is shown over here. So phi equal to 0 is the front stagnation point, 180 degree is the base point. So 0 to 180 is the seam side of the ball and then 180 through 60 degree is the non-seam side of the ball. The coloring scheme is a large CP is 1, so stagnation point has a CP of exactly 1.0 and the more blue color it is, that means there is high suction on the surface of the sphere. So this is a diagram which is let us say a CP diagram at each value of the Reynolds number. What do we see from this? Let us say what happens at Reynolds number 2 into 10 to the 5th. So we have high pressure at the stagnation point followed by a suction close to the shoulder. So you can see at around 90 degree you have very low pressure. That is because we have a conventional swing and there is a laminar separation bubble on the upper surface on the seam side. On the non-seam side I would have to start from 360 and then move at 270 to the shoulder back to 180 at the base point. So again if I look at 2 into 10 to the 5th, I have stagnation pressure followed by some suction at 270 and followed again by a pressure close to the base pressure at the base point. So overall you see there is a very high suction on the seam side and relatively low suction on the non-seam side which gives rise to conventional swing. Okay, so you would get a positive C Z uh, coefficient. When the system goes into a reverse swing, then things change. Then on the seam side, there is a slight reduction in the suction as seen here, but on the non-seam side, that means on this side, you see a massive increase in the suction. So you get a dark blue color here and that is why now you get reverse swing. The same can be seen from the CP curves also which are taken at a certain station. Okay. So if you see for the first curve shown here, that is actually in the uh, very early stages of the conventional swing. So this is the seam side from 0 to 180 and then 180 to 360 is the non-seam side as we saw in the earlier picture. So you get again uh, a very high suction on the seam side, but on the means on the non-seam side you have a reasonably low suction. But when the ball gets into the regime of reverse swing, which is this brown colored curve here at the bottom, then you get a reasonably large suction on the non-seam side and this area here shows the presence of the laminar separation bubble and the laminar separation bubble disappears from the seam side. How about the velocity vectors from the PIV measurements? So this picture has been made from the time averaged uh, PIV measurements which I explained a little while ago. The flow is from left to right and the top two frames are for smooth sphere and the bottom two uh, frames are for a sphere with one trip. So this is a subcritical flow where you have laminar separation. So you can see the, the flow has separated here. So blue is the region of low speed, that is actually a reversing flow. And when you go to a supercritical Reynolds number, then you get the delay in flow separation and the separation zone is also much smaller than in the case of a critical regime. It is interesting for a cricket ball. So this picture is taken at in the regime of conventional swing. So the seam side sees a transition to turbulence and therefore the boundary layer stays attached for a longer region of the sphere. There is an early flow separation on the non-seam side 
in fact it is very similar to what you would see for a smooth sphere and then when you go to the regime of reverse swing which is at a relatively larger Renard number then you notice that on the non seam side the flow stays attached for a longer region of the sphere compared to the seam side okay so now there's a reversal of the force all right now what we can do is we can draw a figure of what is the force that acts on the ball with respect to the speed and we can use these curves to estimate the trajectory of the ball so what i can now do is i can assume that the ball is in a state of quasi steady motion at every Reynolds number so suppose i am a bowler i deliver a ball at let's say 140 kilometers per hour and i'm going to lose the ball is going to lose speed as it moves towards the batsman it's going to slow down because of the drag acting on it so i have a picture of the drag versus speed and i have a picture of the lateral force versus speed so suppose i start at 150 kilometers per hour i know what is the drag on the ball i know what is the lateral force on the ball so i can do a short term time integration calculate after time delta t what is the new location of my cricket ball and then i can integrate it till i reach the batsman okay so that way i can actually estimate the trajectory from these force measurements now we have done that for let's say these three values of seam location 10 degree 20 degree and 30 degree i am going to show you results for the 20 degree seam location all right so here is the bowler and that's about 20 yards and there's a batsman at the end of the pitch so suppose i am a bowler who goes at 150 kilometers per hour by the time the ball reaches the batsman it has slowed down considerably maybe to something like 140 or 138 kilometers per hour you lose about 10 percent of your speed and because there's a change in Reynolds number so obviously uh, you are going to also have a change in the lateral force that acts on the ball so one could actually go back to this curve and say that as my speed reduces i actually move in this direction of the curve so I may go from a region of reverse swing to a region of swing or I may go from a region of swing to no swing and so on. So this is what has been done for the trajectory estimation. So for a 20 degree seam we integrate the Newton's law of motion and the lateral movement of the ball is shown in this picture. So let us first look at what happens at 150 kilometers per hour. So those are the square boxes in green color and one can see that the ball goes through a reverse swing the same bowler he now delivers at let's say 90 kilometers per hour relatively slower now the ball actually goes through a conventional swing okay and in between there would be certain speeds where in fact it transitions through a reverse swing to a conventional swing so you would see something called a late swing in fact there are some experimental measurements shown in this with the blue boxes and these estimations from the present work they agree quite well with it okay you can notice that the ball can swing up to a meter so that is the maximum uh, lateral movement of the ball by the time it reaches the batsman in the case of reverse swing the movement is only about half a meter okay so a real skillful bowler has many options he can change the seam angle of the ball he can change the speed of the ball okay and of course he can change uh, the way he bowls uh, from the, the location that he bowls with respect to the wickets or how he uses the crease okay So what is shown here is uh, this picture has been repeated this is the previous picture and to show the results in a more uh, concise manner what I have done is I have looked at that I am a batsman and receiving the ball at different speeds 
what is the lateral movement at different speeds. So suppose I have, I have been bowled a delivery at 50 kilometers per hour at a seam angle of 20 degrees. The ball has actually given me a lateral movement of about quarter of a meter. Okay? If I have received a ball at about 90 kilometers per hour, then I see the lateral movement is about a meter. But then if I have been bowled at about 140 kilometers per hour, then I see the ball has reversed and the movement is about negative half a meter. Okay? So this kind of breaks the myth that fast bowlers have that the faster you bowl, the more the ball will swing. That is not true. In fact, what you can realize from common sense is that if you bowl too quickly, then the ball crosses the pitch very quickly, so it spends very less time in the air. So even though there is force on the ball, the lateral force, it does not move that much. On the other hand, if you have a bowler bowling at very low speed, then the ball stays in air for a long time, but there is not enough force on it. So there is an optimal region where you can get maximum swing. So on a cricket ball, a new cricket ball at 20 degree seam angle, it appears that somewhere between 90 to 100 kilometers per hour, you can get maximum seam movement and at large speeds you can get reversing. I want to show you now what is the effect of seam angle. Okay? So we will fix the speed at 146 kilometers per hour okay? and these are different seam angles. So the black color is 10 degree, there is red color which is 20 degree and the green color which is 30 degree. Okay? And you can notice that if I release the ball at 146 kilometers per hour, then as the ball moves in air towards the batsman, the speed is going to reduce. So I am going to go towards actually the origin towards the left and therefore my trajectory will be determined by that. So here is what the trajectory looks like for three different seam angles. The speed is the same 146 kilometers per hour. The bowler who uses a seam angle of 10 degree would see a massive swing. If he uses a seam angle of 20 degree, he sees a massive reverse swing. On the other hand, if he goes to 30 degree, then he would see reverse swing in the beginning and a swing towards the end of the trajectory. So that is sometimes called as a late swing. There is also a very important uh, uh, phenomena that happens in uh, practical cricket which is as the ball becomes old. Often what the bowlers do is they decide as a team that they are going to keep one side of the ball as shiny and they will keep the other side as rough. Okay? So we try to do experiments in a systematic manner by taking one cricket ball, a brand new cricket ball and we use sandpaper to rough one of the sides of the cricket ball and by placing it in the wind tunnel so that the flow goes from left to right, we are saying the seam side is rough. I can actually now reverse the ball and make the non -side, seam side rough by using the same object. Next what I can do is I can actually make the seam also rough and that is what is shown here. So here the non seam side is rough and the seam is also rough and then I can reverse it and do it an experiment of both the seam and the seam side being rough. Finally I can make the other side also rough and I can get a completely rough cricket ball. So it would be interesting to see what the force on these balls would be. Common sense tells us if I have a situation like this then the flow goes over the seam and it goes over the rough side. So it encourages the boundary layer to become turbulent even earlier. On the other hand, if I look at a situation like this, then I have the seam side making the boundary layer go through a transition, but then I have surface roughness here which would also try to make the boundary layer turbulent and then there would be a competition between the two. 
okay so it is not clear as to which side would become turbulent earlier so it would really depend on how rough this seam side or this non seam side is and how good is the roughness of the seam and so on and so forth so let's look at the results so shown here are some results for these different configurations of the ball so the first case is of a completely new ball so that's the blue curve okay as you can see so you get swing and then reverse swing at a certain speed of the ball if you make the seam side rough okay which is this green uh, color boxes the seam side rough then you see that uh, there is a little bit of change but essentially the same kind of phenomena the surprising part is this case where now the non seam side is rough so let's look at actually the red curve the red curve in fact shows that we can have reverse swing right at the beginning in fact what is happening is that because of this side being very rough it becomes turbulent at a very low speed and therefore the ball can start reversing at a very low speed and finally when the reynolds number increasing it actually starts giving you a conventional swing the case of a completely rough cricket ball that cr it shows pretty much the same behavior as a new ball but everything is little bit shifted to a smaller speed there are some other differences but i don't want to get into that in this talk so it's the same picture but with the with a little bit of more uh, data here all kinds of uh, seam surfaces are shown here but again i would like to show you with the speeds now the the x axis now has the speed so what i would like to point out is that if i take a new ball it reverses at something like 145 150 km per hour but if i take this ball and use the concept of contrast swing so i keep one side smooth and make that as the seam side when i deliver the ball and this is the non seam side which i keep it as rough i could get reverse swing at speeds as low as 50 km per hour so in t20 cricket for example okay as soon as the ball gets a little bit old uh, you could actually have uh, people come in you know somebody like kumble who is a fast spinner and they could they can do wonders in fact they can reverse swing a slightly old cricket ball of course this is a very exaggerated a uh, case of a ball where the sandpaper has been applied on one side and the other side has been kept as new in a real cricket uh, both sides would lose their polish and one side would be manually made shiny by using saliva of course in the new regime of pandemic uh, the bowlers are not allowed to use saliva at all and therefore the game has become a little bit more interesting these are now the trajectory for a rough and cricket balls exactly the same format as i showed you earlier and i just want you to uh, look at uh, two curves one is the new ball which we have already seen so the maximum swing you can get at about 100 km per hour and then it starts reversing at you know a higher speed perhaps something like 130 km per hour but if you look at the non seam side rough and a 30 degree seam angle you could get very large reverse swing at even 50 km per hour and the ball would do a conventional swing at very large speeds so you can if you are an intelligent cricketer by looking at the condition of the ball by using the seam angle by using your speed and how to orient the ball you can actually deceive the batsman so it's extremely complex with that i would now like to move on to uh the shuttle shuttle cock and show you how the aerodynamics of that uh becomes extremely important so this is one of the very famous players one of my favorites lindan there are two kinds of shuttles that we often use a duck feather shuttle and a synthetic shuttle 
This of course has longevity. It can last for many games. This one is brittle for, for reasons that you understand best. And it also is not very desirable from the harm to animals. So it would be interesting to see how should I design a synthetic shuttlecock so that it behaves exactly like a duck feather shuttlecock. So far, the synthetic shuttlecocks do not behave the same way as duck feather and I want to show you a little bit of why that happens. So this is some work that has been done in the past, for example by Cook and what has been shown is that there is some entrainment uh, by these gaps in the shuttlecock which form certain separation zones, the wake and that is what increases the drag on the shuttlecocks. We use computational fluid dynamics uh, to understand the aerodynamics of the shuttlecocks. We chose three models, a completely solid skirt, then a model of a feather shuttlecock and a model of a synthetic shuttlecock. So here is a question for you before you go to the next slide. Which one of these do you think generates the maximum drag? So for the point of view of badminton player. I take a shuttle and try to hit and make the shuttle go to the third court. Which one is more difficult to get to the third court? The no gap, the feather or the synthetic? Okay. When I first thought about this, my vote was that this shuttlecock should have the maximum drag. Okay, it is more like a bluff body the flow is coming from left to right. So it would lead to a very large wake, very large flow separation. It would have huge drag and then of course these two. Let us look at the answer. So we did a CFD study, we put a mesh around the shuttlecock, put it in a large domain. This is a close up view of the mesh and these are the results from the study along with data from other people. This is the gapless shuttlecock. Okay, these different things that you see V2F, RK epsilon, these are the turbulence models that have been used. Uh, don't worry about them too much. The gapless shuttlecock gave us the least amount of drag, which was extremely surprising. Then came the feather shuttle, and then, of course, the synthetic shuttle. So, this has the highest drag, this has the medium drag, and the gapless has the least drag. And we are very curious, why does this happen? So first we tried to estimate that which part of the shuttlecock contributes to the drag. So we divide it into five regions, the cork region, then the inner skirt, the outer skirt and then of course the gap regions. What was found is that regions 4 and 5, they actually contribute the maximum drag. Okay. Almost 75 percent of the drag, it comes from these two regions and most of the drag is pressure drag, the viscous drag is very little, the skin friction drag is very little, most of it is a pressure drag, again confirming that this is a bluff body flow. So the whole design of the shuttlecock is actually governed by the skirt. So these are the pressure distribution on the three shuttlecocks. This is the no gap, this is the duck feather and that is the synthetic shuttlecock. Let me show you some sketches of CP along a line which is at a section of the stock. So there are two pressures at these regions inside and the outside. So wherever there is a solid body, I would have two pressures. And what is interesting is that the pressure difference between the inner and outer for the case of no gap is very small. It is extremely large for the case of the duck feather, especially in this zone and then it is a little bit distributed for the case of synthetic zone. The drag arises because of the difference in the two pressures. If these two pressures are same on the inside and outside, you can show that there will be no drag on the shuttlecock. Okay. So this kind of explains why this body 
the gapless shuttlecock has the least amount of drab um, amongst them. What you will also notice is that the center of pressure for these two shuttlecocks is different. In fact, if you look at the center of difference of pressure for this shuttlecock, the duck feather, it is more towards the feathers away from the center of gravity. On the other hand, for the synthetic shuttlecock, it is little bit more distributed and the center of delta p is more towards the cork. So, what happens when this shuttlecock gets deformed a little bit? So, as it gets older, it has more effect on the dynamics of the shuttlecock as compared to this one because this is closer to the center of gravity. So, a duck feather shuttlecock requires more skill to handle it as it gets old and it needs a more skillful player. That is why skillful players would prefer handling a duck feather shuttlecock as opposed to a synthetic shuttlecock which is a little bit more consistent. There is also a change in the deformation which I will show you in the later slides. So, here is the same thing uh, illustrated the difference in the pressure on the inside and outside. So, that is the gapless, the black line, the blue line is the feather shuttlecock and this one the red one is the synthetic shuttlecock. These are the velocity profiles and what is interesting is as you know from your control volume analysis, the drag actually depends on the momentum deficit at the end of the wake. So, even though there is a huge wake for the gapless shuttlecock, but if you look at the velocity profiles at the far end, this has much less deficit compared to for example, the synthetic shuttlecock. Okay. So, therefore, this has less drag compared to the other two. These are some uh, pictures of the velocity at different sections of the shuttlecock and you can see that because of the entrainment of the air through the gaps in the shuttlecocks, you get some very interesting flow patterns. I am afraid I do not have enough time to go into these details. This is how the vorticity uh, which we have studied in this course would look like for these complicated bodies. You can see there is a big difference in the flow structures for the synthetic versus the duck feather shuttlecock simply because of the entrainment through the gaps and also because of the way uh, the solid surface and the porosity is distributed. We did some wind tunnel studies uh, on these uh, shuttlecocks, the plastic the synthetic ones and the duck feather ones and I just wanted you to look at uh, the two curves. Okay, let me point these out. So, the red one here is the feather shuttlecock and the speed goes all the way from 10 meters per second to 60 meters per second. Okay. The duck feather shuttlecock retains its shape, you can see it has got a little bit deformed, but it still retains its shape. So, the drag coefficient reduces just a little bit. Look at the synthetic shuttlecock. So, if you hit a high speed smash, the shuttlecock actually deforms. So, you can see almost it has a rectangular cross section and the drag coefficient can really reduce. So, if I hit a smash, then as the shuttlecock travels at high speed, it kind of compresses and it has less uh, drag and therefore, it will go much faster compared to a real duck feather shuttlecock. So, if you are a smasher, then you seem to have an advantage with a synthetic shuttlecock. We tried to replicate this using CFD, okay, so full Navier Stokes and full structural analysis and see if we can make a model where you can do a fluid structure interaction. And what we are able to see is that actually beyond a certain speed, the shuttlecock buckles. Okay, so, it retains a shape as the original shape at low speeds, but beyond a certain speed you can see the shuttlecock has completely buckled, it has deformed and thereby you get a massive reduction in the drag coefficient. So, here is a picture of 
the deformation on the shuttlecock it can actually go up to 9 millimeters ok. So, so the compression of the skirt is as high as 9 millimeters in these pictures. I hope you enjoyed this session and thank you very much.